Thanks to Dell, I got a chance to go to New York back in December to check out all their new stuff way ahead of CES. So for the past few weeks, I've actually been using two of their new OLED monitors instead of trying to shout at you from a crowded CES floor. I'm very excited today because I finally get to tell you about my experience with their new 32 inch 4K 240 Hertz OLED and their new 27 inch 1440p 360 Hertz OLED. These are both using the brand new third gen QD OLED panels from Samsung. They both cost quite a bit less than I expected and spoiler alert, they're both phenomenal. If you're not up on it, QD OLED is a different tech than what we saw in all the 27 inch 1440p 240 hertz OLEDs from last year. Those are all using LG's W OLED panel and there's a few really important differences that we'll touch on throughout the video. Starting with the AW2725DF, this is a 27 inch flat 1440p 360 hertz priced at 899 US, which is a very solid price point compared to what we saw last year. The colorway here is like a dark graphite and black. It is fully articulated so you can go full portrait in either direction. I love what they've done with the base here. It's small and it's hex shaped. That makes it really easy to use very close up or with the tilted keyboard or oversized mouse pad. The biggest drawback for me is the height is on the shorter side, making this a really strong contender for a monitor arm, which is really easy to do if you want. There's three zones of assignable lighting, the power button, the Alienware logo, and the number 27 on the rear. Big 360 degree heat sink here on the back. The menu shows that there is a fan in here. That was my only clue. It only has one level and based on my use, it's completely silent. You get two DisplayPort 1.4 and one HDMI 2.1, so you've got full console support. It is a little odd to me that they went with two display ports on this instead of two HDMIs like we see on the 32 inch. This model uses FreeSync Premium Pro to handle variable refresh rate. I did test for the dreaded VRR flicker that sometimes affects darker areas on OLED while using variable refresh rate, and there's none on this copy. This monitor looks and feels spectacular, and because it's 360 hertz with some performance specs, it makes this suitable not only for the casual or single player gamer, but also for the competitive FPS. Crowd. We'll get into all that right after a quick word from today's sponsor. One thing I started doing a lot more of in 2023 is traveling for work. And one of my least favorite things about that is packing a separate charger for my phone, my watch, my laptop. I thought that's just how it worked until I found Ugreen, a sponsor of today's video. This is Apple's 96 watt charging brick with one USB-C connection. And this is the Ugreen Nexode Pro 100 watt charger with two USB-C and one USB-A. If I need something charged in a hurry, I can put all 100 watts to a single port. That can charge a MacBook Pro 14 inch from zero to 86% in 60 minutes. When I need to charge multiple devices, it can split that power up between my laptop, my phone, and my watch or AirPods, all in a form factor that's small enough to carry around in my pocket. Thanks to their new Airpira tech and GAN Infinity chips, the Nexode Pro line has a 37% increase to energy density versus their standard Nexode line, making the Nexode Pro their smallest chargers yet. If you need more power, their four port 160 watt chargers got you covered. Or if you need something really slim, their 65 watt three port cookie charger sits really close to the wall, making it fit places most ordinary charging bricks can. not All of these support these various fast charger protocols and 45 watt Samsung super fast charging 2.0. They're compatible with all modern smartphones, tablets, and laptops. And all of these include their millisecond temperature detection that prevents overheating and overcharge. So you never have to worry about damaging your battery longevity. Click the link in the description to check out the new Nexode Pro chargers from Ugreen. One of the first things you'll notice with these is the coating that looks glossy at a glance, but it's actually semi-gloss. So these these do still have an anti-reflective film. It's just not remotely as matte as the matte coatings we saw in last year's W OLED models, and it's not quite as glossy as what you might find on a glossy W OLED TV like this 48 inch LG CX, which is basically a black mirror if there's any light in the studio at all. Some people out there are very passionate that using a matte coating on an OLED completely ruins an OLED because it has a tendency to make the blacks look more gray and it causes a grainier or less sharp image. With the different OLED technologies, this argument gets pretty deep, way too deep for today's video. But there's a seriously excellent breakdown about all this over on TFT Central that I will link down in the description if you wanna know more. We haven't really seen glossy coating on W OLED panels in monitor sizes yet. I'm not counting dough, and sadly, it's now been confirmed that the 480 Hertz W OLED that ASUS announced at CES is in fact a matte coating. Turns out whoever set the booth up forgot to take the plastic protective film off the front of the monitor. Horrible. I can't say that using the AW2725DF side by side with the PG27 AQDM, the Alienware does look more sharp and it's got much better viewing angles because you don't get the weird glare from the matte coating. Using it on its own, I probably never would have even noticed the grain that the matte coating adds to a W OLED, but when you see them side by side at full white, it's very obvious, even if the cameras aren't picking it up. But QD OLED has some drawbacks of its own. If you're using it in a dark or very low light room, it looks amazing. But the more ambient light you add to your room, the more the black 
black levels raised to more of a gray. And comparing even these newest third gen panels to a matte coated W OLED, the difference is very noticeable. Outside of extremely low light where they tie, the W OLED maintains significantly deeper blacks at any other light level. OLED isn't a great choice for brighter rooms, but W OLED still does much better in this regard. Because these are OLED, both these panels have incredibly fast gray to gray response times, and there's no overdrive modes to contend with. Both measure a 0.1 millisecond average with very minor overshoot. They're advertised at a 0.03 gray to gray, but the LDAT's only granular down to 0.1. That's still insanely fast, so it's kind of irrelevant. Motion blur on the 27 inch 360 hertz is insane. It's one of the best I've seen before. It beats out the PG27 AQDM. It only gets beat out by monitors that are using backlight strobing like ULMB2 or DIAC. The 32 inch 240 is still very good as well, just not quite up to the 360 hertz. Still, we're operating at elite levels here where these are only getting beat out by strobing tech. All right, this 32 inch 4K 240 hertz is setting up to be a probable end game for a lot of users out there. It's priced at $1199 US. I fully expected this to come in more like $1499. This monitor is curved at $1700R. It's really slight, like you barely notice it. If you just don't like a curve, the QD OLED panel inside here is flexible. So we will see a flat option very soon in the form of the newly announced ASUS PG32 UCDM. The stand on this model shares a lot of design language with the AW3423DW. It's mostly white with black accents, same three assignable lighting zones here, no lighting around the rear ring though. The stand has height, tilt, and swivel, but no pivot, which means you can't go portrait with this and you better hope that your desk is level. We've got that same large 360 degree heatsink design. This does have active cooling and there's two fan speeds. One is totally silent and the other, the high one is barely audible. Overall, this whole unit looks and feels very premium. You get one DisplayPort 1.4 and two HDMI 2.1, so no issue getting 4K 120 from your consoles with variable refresh rate. One of them has Dolby Atmos signal pass through as well, and this monitor does have Dolby Vision for HDR. Strangely, the variable refresh rate here is different. There's no FreeSync Premium Pro. It's stated as G-Sync compatible with VESA Adaptive Sync. There's no dedicated G-Sync module, and I'm sorry to report that this monitor does have the VRR flicker. The camera makes it look way worse than it is. It's not easy to capture. It's not the big horizontal rolling lines that you're seeing. It's specifically the light to dark flicker on the far right side of the screen. This could be a big deal to you, but to me, it feels like a small knock on what is otherwise a breathtaking display. Both these panels are very good, but the pixel density at 4K feels like you could just reach right into this thing. It's that good. Thanks to OLED, we get that infinite contrast ratio and the colors here are spectacular. Color coverage in SDR is insane on both of these. I measured 99.9% .9 RGB GB coverage and 99.4% DCI-P3 on the 27 inch and 100% RGB with 98.7% DCI-P3 on the 32 inch. For max brightness and SDR, these can hit 257 and 258 nits respectively. So just a touch brighter than the PG27 AQDM and about 20 nits brighter than the AW3423DW. There's a lot of picture preset modes here and after testing all of them, standard looks the best to me. It looks the most natural. It's got a white point of right about 6100. I have some weird behavior on my copy of the 27 inch where sometimes it hits that max SDR brightness right in the high 250s like we're expecting to see and sometimes it just decides it wants to max out at like 220 to 225. I never saw this on the 32 inch so it could just be a small firmware bug on the 27 inch or it could just be my copy. Either way 220 to 225 is still plenty of brightness it's just something to point out. The creator mode is really consistent. You can adjust your gamma in here so just set that to 2.2. If you're consuming content, gaming or watching movies, DCI-P3 is the way to go. It gets you wide color gamut and you get some really nice saturation. It has a white point of 5800K. Now both to my eye and the meters, it's skewed green and that holds true on both monitors. So I personally prefer the standard mode, but just pick whichever one looks good to you. If you're creating content and you need more accurate colors, go for the sRGB mode. It's got a white point of 6400, just less saturation. This degree of color accuracy and all these options effectively makes both these monitors an ideal choice for both gaming and content creation without really sacrificing anything. And that's incredible to see. There is a custom color mode in here if you wanna go in and really tweak this thing to get that white point to that perfect 6500, just be aware that using that mode is gonna cost you about 30 nits of brightness. I do wanna drive home too that during filming, I had both of these monitors in some really high brightness conditions and they actually really impressed me. They do look their best in low light environments, but they held up surprisingly well with a pretty decent amount of ambient light. The HDR experience on both is really impressive. And again, being OLED, we don't need to worry about dimming zones or halos. I don't have a way to professionally measure HDR performance yet, but everything looks great in the shadows, the colors, the skin 
skin tones seem to be spot on. These have the same two modes we've seen from Alienware before, both the HDR 400 True Black and the HDR 1000 mode, which allows for peak brightness up to 1000 nits for highlights, but at the cost of lower overall sustained brightness. There's a few other options in here you can play with depending on what you're watching, but for me, HDR 1000 is the move, and the 32 inch has Dolby Vision, which is great to see. Alan Wake 2 is an absolute experience in HDR on both, but especially at 4K. No issues with brightness here at all. The HDR is very solid. Because we have some improvements to the QD OLED tech this generation, we do see some improvements to the text fringing issue you see with OLEDs too. On the 4K panel, it's barely noticeable at 100%. 150%, it's a little more so if you're looking for it. This is more noticeable on the 1440p, but even there, I don't think it's that bad. Everybody has a different level of sensitivity to this, but when you look at everything else that this panel does so well, I just don't think this is a deal breaker. Burn-in or image retention has been another major area of concern for people that are still cautious to go OLED. And the short answer is, we still don't really know, but manufacturers seem very confident to go all in on OLED this year. Ratings.com has done some burn-in tests on the TV side that do suggest that QD OLED burns in faster than W OLED, but the results vary quite a bit depending on how each manufacturer implemented anti-burn-in features. They also included the AW3423DW in a recent test, but by now that panel tech is two generations old. The good news is that these have solid anti-burn-in features, but I'm not seeing any specific modes for logo or taskbar detection. I can't confirm that the pixel refresh at power off is functioning like it should. The big thing though is that unlike other manufacturers, Dell offers three year warranties on their displays and that includes OLED burn-in. So what we have here are a couple monitors that are very, very good. The hype behind these is completely warranted in my opinion. The 2725DF is gonna be a really solid sweet spot for all kinds of gaming, media consumption, and is still suitable for productivity work. The 360 Hertz, the insanely fast graded gray speeds, the very solid motion blur performance means it's gonna hold up even for the most demanding competitive FPS crowds too. After doing this for years, this is the closest thing I've seen yet to the elusive one and done do everything monitor for me. And being 1440p means you're not gonna need as much GPU muscle to push those frames like you would with 4K or ultra wide. And the consoles now have native 1440p with variable refresh rate too, so you're covered there. The only thing that gives me any caution at all about recommending it is that we know that toward the middle of the year, like end of Q2, we're gonna see a 480 Hertz W OLED panel. But now that we know that that's gonna be a matte coating and not glossy, I still think this is the one to beat. Now that we have 360 Hertz on the OLED side, there's very little reason to continue to recommend something like the PG27AQN, where it only beats it out in motion blur when it's using something like ULMB2, and that's just not enough to offset the Ws on the OLED side. The 32 inch is a very easy recommend. If you have a high-end rig, you're already a 4K gamer, it's so nice. Consoles look insane, AAA PC titles look insane, HDR is insane, everything you put on this monitor <laughs> looks insane. The fact that it's 240 hertz means as long as you have the GPU power, this can hang with competitive FPS, no sweat. This is a monitor you can buy now and you'll still be growing into it in a few years. I will be covering the majority of the new displays as they come out this year, so be sure to subscribe if you wanna see more. As always, the best place to talk gear or get specific recommendations for your setup is in the private Discord, which I will link down below. That's it for today. Thanks so much for watching. I will catch you all in the next one. Stay up.